It is my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Jim Cathcart. All of us are speakers, but only a few have truly made it their life's work. Your next speaker has done just that. Starting as untrained and awkward presenter in Little Rock, Arkansas 45 years ago, he has risen to the top of the speaking profession. 3,300 paid speeches. Best-selling author of 23 books. Past president of the National Speakers Association and recipient of our own Golden Gavel Award in the millennium year 2001. He has spoken in 23 major cities in China, all 50 US states, Canada, South America, Asia, and Europe, plus 10 trips to Australia. Inducted into the Speakers Hall of Fame and the Sales and Marketing Hall of Fame. Our keynote speaker started on our stage in 1995 in San Diego. As I stated earlier, he attained the 2001 Golden Gavel Award. And finally, after 21 years, we have him back on our stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jim Cathcart. As I was saying in 2001, there are two ways you can achieve your goals. One, as an arrow shooting toward your goal. In that case, all the energy's gotta come from you, all the accuracy's gotta come from you, and all the effort comes from you. The other way is be attractive. The other way, is be a magnet for what you want. Oh, that's, yeah, okay. <laughs> Isn't she adorable? Look at that. Okay, if, what do I mean by become a magnet for what you want? Well, I mean acquire the qualities, the personal traits, the attributes, the skills, the knowledge and such that will make you the ideal candidate for whatever it is you're seeking. Does that make sense to you? Good, okay. Become the person who would attract the results you seek. Sam Duggar was 11 years old when I married his older sister in 1970. Now, the year before, 1969, America had landed a man on the moon. All the news media was saturated with stories about astronauts. That's all you heard everywhere you went. Sam was enthralled. He couldn't, you know, that was the only thing he wanted to think about. Couldn't focus on anything else. And he said when he was 13 years old, he said, I'm going to be an astronaut. Now, his dad worked in a factory. His mom was a secretary for a government agency. He had four older sisters and no money. The prospects of him being an astronaut were pretty slim. But I was talking with him. I had, at that time, I'd gotten involved in the JCs, the Junior Chamber of Commerce, and I was learning things like goal setting and positive thinking and you know, reading all the motivational books. And I said, Sam, if you want to be an astronaut, start acting every day like a person who would become an astronaut in the future. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, for example, in school, don't hang out with the wrong crowd. Don't take risks. Get good grades. Be respectful of, of the school and, and of your fellow students. And work hard at what you want. And especially get good at science and mathematics. So Sam did. When Sam graduated high school, he had not gotten in trouble. He got great grades all the way through school. Was the valedictorian of his class and was nominated to the Air Force Academy. Whoa. Where he majored in astronautical engineering. See, when he was a little kid at home, he was making little toy, not toy, model rockets and going to a neighborhood park and shooting the rockets off. You know, I'm gonna be an astronaut, I'm gonna be an astronaut. So everything he did as a little kid led up to that moment. 
He got to the Air Force Academy, graduated, became a pilot, an instructor pilot, an instructor of instructor pilots. I mean, Sam really did well, and then he changed his mind about astronaut. <laughs> well, where'd that come from? And I asked him at the time, I said, Sam, I thought you wanted to be an astronaut. He said, no, I just wanted to fly airplanes. He said, you know, when I was little, I didn't know what an astronaut was. And the closer I got to it, the less appealing that lifestyle seemed, because that's all in, right? And he said, I just wanted to fly planes. Sam has had a career. He's almost a retirement age already. He's had an entire career as a Delta Airlines pilot flying all over the world. Did he succeed or fail? Absolutely. He became the kind of person who would be chosen for the Air Force Academy. He became the kind of person who would be selected as a pilot for a major airline. He became the kind of person who would live the life he chose to live. That's the advice that I think you and I need to be embracing. There's two types of preparation in speaking, messenger and message. If you work hard preparing your message, you know what you'll have? A good speech. If you work hard preparing the messenger yourself, every speech you give will be a good speech. Right? Teach a person to fish, make them a fisherman. Right? <laughs> Big difference. Big difference, right? So message or messenger preparation comes down to this. Years ago, I, I started touring China, doing major lectures over there. And uh, I went to, um, to Shanghai first, and then 23 major cities around the country. And I'd have people come up at the end of my speeches, and they'd say, excuse me, excuse me, teacher, master. They would say, because they always treated me like some great guru, they would say, how do I become a great speaker? And here's what I told them. Ready? Become a great person and say, okay, I'll speak. I mean, that sounds kind of lame on some levels, but on the other, the other plane, don't you think that's absolutely true? It, it's not about having a great speech. It's about being a great source and bringing value to people and touching their lives in a meaningful way. When we change the lighting here, I wanted to step over into my little private studio to talk with you. Um, I want to share something with you. I spent more time preparing this speech than almost any speech I've given since the year 2001. I'm 75 years old. I've delivered 3,300 speeches all over the world. I'm used to this. But for this one, I recognize what a phenomenal honor it is to be back here for a third time after so many years, virtually a generation, and to have the opportunity to talk to people, talk through people. So the big difference, most audiences you talk to them. This audience you talk through them because everyone in this room is gonna be sharing ideas that they got here with other people around the world. That's pretty powerful. So my first slides tray in my PowerPoint had like 92 slides in it. <laughs> Seriously, no, I mean, it was, it was embarrassingly bad. I, well, I've been at this so long, I've been at this 46 years, so I've got an abundance of what I think is pretty good material. You know, it's been proven, it's been delivered around the world and received well. So I called Lisa Marie David, my friend there, and uh, she's a colleague of mine, and, and uh, had offered to let me rehearse with her. So I went through the whole thing with her, and she was very supportive and encouraging and gave me some good ideas. And then I called my son, who's a, a general manager for uh, Four Seasons Hotels out in California, and, and uh, I said, Jim, Jim Jr., I said, here's the talk. What do you think? He said, well, I, I wouldn't say that, and you can lose that. That's two examples that are the same, and blah, 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 blah. but good talk. And then the next day, he called me back. And he said, hey, Dad, I, I think you ought to 
rethink this. <laughs> now, this is like Saturday last. I mean, we're talking recent. And uh, I said, well, uh, okay, in what ways? And he gave me tips. Well, anyway, I went to sleep that night thinking about it, woke up the next morning, cut out all but like 25 slides, which you are seeing today. And uh, really restructured the entire message. Now, here was my dilemma. Most of the message kind of centers around me and my life. And I thought, that just seems selfish or, or self-centered or something like that. I don't know if that's right. And then I thought, now, wait a minute. They tell us in science, if you want to test an idea, you start with a premise, and then you prove or disprove your premise. Premise, gravity works. Proof, right? Premise, that dog won't bite. <laughs> Yet. Uh, so some premises are like universal truths and some are situationally true. So here's my premise. Become the person who would achieve the goals you dream of achieving and the goals you dream of achieving will be your natural byproduct. Now let's look at my career and see if that's borne out. Thank you. So this is, by the way, a picture. Let's go back to the picture that, that I'm looking at, Cavett Award. Cavett Robert is the founder of the National Speakers Association. That's Bob Pike and me in the photo in front of the statue of Cavett. The Cabot Award in the National Speakers Association is the equivalent of the Golden Gavel with Toastmasters International. Cabot's the founder. Cabot, by the way, in the year 1942, won the international competition for Toastmasters. His coach, Ralph Smedley. Yeah, let's just go, whoa. Yeah, and he founded the National Speakers Association, was a good friend of mine. And so that's, that's phenomenal. Become a great person, then agree to give speeches. It's like Pioneer Electronics says, you know, you can't improve the system until you improve the speakers. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what we're kind of all about here, right? This is a magnet, coincidentally, that's been on my refrigerator in the garage since like 1974. What you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. It's who we bring. It's not the, what was the way I said it, Paula? It's not the way you serve the food. It's what you bring to the table. Is that a keeper? Okay, all right. So that's, that's the way that works. Because when you're up here, think about this. You're not by yourself. Everybody out there wants this to be a really good presentation. Everybody. Even the ones that don't like you. They're thinking, I, you know, this guy stinks, but I, I hope his talk is good. Because I'm in it too, right? So everybody out there wants you to do well. Here's my suggestion. Be the person they're hoping you are. When I was president of the National Speakers Association in the year of 1989, and I got on the plane in, in Washington, D.C., and at the very last minute, uh, just before they closed the door, a man came rushing on, and he sat down right next to me, first row, first class. I was by the window. And I looked over, and I saw this man with bushy eyebrows, and I recognized him instantly. He was the Speaker of the House of Representatives. He, Nancy Pelosi is that position today. This was Jim Wright, James Wright from Texas. He was Speaker of the House. So after we got airborne, I said, hi, I'm Jim. He said, hey, me too. I said, yeah, I know. I said, you're the Speaker. He said, yes, I am. I said, this is a big coincidence. <laughs> he said, how is that? I said, you're the Speaker, and I'm the President of them. <laughs> and he had never heard of the National Speakers Association. He said, so 
what is this? And I told him, you know, professional speakers. And, and uh, he said, how many members? And I said, um, 3,600. He said, out of those 3,600, how many of them really are, you know, like full-on professional speakers? I said, probably 2,000. He said, and how many speeches would a typical member give in a, in a typical year? I said, well, you know, I've given as many as 120 talks a year, but I would say on average, 50 talks a year for the 2,000 2, people. He said, 2,000 people, 50 talks a year, what's the average size of an audience? I said, well, for me, you know, big and little, uh, it averages out to 256, I actually keep the numbers. But I would say a good safe bet for across the whole organization, 50 people. He said, so 2,000 people speaking to 50 people at a time, 50 times a year. He said, that's 5 million people. That's a very influential organization. Whew. I hadn't thought about it until then. Imagine, I mean, imagine if they all, inter all agreed on something. <laughs> and, and, and influenced 5 million people a year. But let's pause for a second and go a hundred times larger to Toastmasters International. A hundred times larger. Over 300,000 members worldwide, 149 countries, 16,600 clubs or something like that. Whoa. Out of 300,000, let's just let's, let's go easy on them, right? Let's say only 200,000 actually give a lot of speeches. And that those 200,000 only give one speech a month for the year, 12 speeches a year each. And their average audience is 10 people. Modest numbers? 24 million people in your audience every year in the, for the, the most persuasive forum known to man public address. Holy smokes. This is a very influential organization. Yeah. Whew. Expect more from yourself. A lot more. Why do I say that? Because I think almost every one of us underestimates profoundly underestimates what we're capable of. And what we expect in the future determines what we get ready for. For example, go back to Sam Duggar. Sam expected to someday become an astronaut. He had a reason not to hang out with the bad kids. He had a reason not to get in trouble. He had a reason to do his homework. He had a reason to be a good person, right? The more we expect from us, the more we get ready for. The more we get ready for, the more possibilities we have, and the person with the most options available to them usually prevails. Hmm. So going along the lines of my own path, let's pose this question. What if you don't expect much? People say, that's cool for you. I mean, look at you, you know, president, of, you know, all this stuff, you're rich, famous, wonderful, you know, all that. No. <laughs> No, but, uh, you know, I've, I've had some moments. But they say, yeah, but that's easy for you. Was not either. I love the line John Maxwell said one time. Somebody said to him, I want to do what you do. He said, are you willing to do what I did? <laughs> That'll take it home, won't it? Yeah. So what if you don't expect much? Well, in 1974, I didn't. True, that's me. <laughs> 50 pounds heavier than this, and uh, five of those with a mustache. And um, <laughs> that guy in Little Rock, Arkansas, where I grew up, was a clerk at the Little Rock Housing Authority, the Urban Renewal Agency. And I was making $525 a month. I had a new wife and baby at home. I had no money in the bank, no college degree, no connections in the community and I was an assistant to a man who didn't need help. <laughs> That's the truth. His name was Bob Moore, and he was bored, 
so you can imagine what my day was like, right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there one day, just, you know, I've read through all the urban renewal books and I've decided that's not my career path. And I don't know what I want to do. And there's a radio playing in the next room and I hear the voice of Earl Nightingale. Earl Nightingale, the Dean of Personal Motivation, previous Golden Gavel recipient, was on 900 radio stations all over the world. And that day, in 1972, the photo was 74, but the, the, the uh, recording happened in 72 on the radio. I heard him say, if you will spend one hour extra every day, studying your chosen field. Five years from now, you'll be a national expert, seven years, international expert. And I did the math. Hour a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year, five years, 1,250 hours on one subject. Yeah, that pretty much gets you ahead of the game. So what did I want to do? What an urban renewal. And it took me a few weeks to realize what I really wanted to do was what the guy on the radio was doing, but I didn't know what that was. I just knew that felt right to me. You know, I want to be an astronaut. It just felt right to me. So I started studying personal development. Fanatically, look that up. My photo used to be in there. I may have faded by now, but <laughs> fanatical. I'm talking every day, all day. The only thing I wanted to think about, talk about, listen to, or be around was personal development. I read all the books, all the classics. You know, I listened to audio programs. I went to seminars, and there weren't many available at the time. I got around successful people. Did everything I could to grow myself as a person. Five years later, I was a full-time speaker and trainer flying around the country and giving seminars. At first, teaching other people's courses like Earl Nightingale's, and then later on, teaching my own. And as you heard, I've written now 23 books of my own and pretty much, you know, done all the, the things that people have on their to-do list in my career path. Wow, how did that guy you saw a minute ago in that photo pull that off? Well, I joined the JCs, the Junior Chamber of Commerce. Joined in January of 1973, that's the actual receipt. And... Uh, at that time, they were big. They had 356,000 members, and they were all over the U.S. and, and JCs International as well. And they, the purpose of JCs is leadership training. So all the community projects they do are done for the purpose of teaching you goal setting, leadership, project planning, things like that. I became a fanatical member. 400 meetings in two years after work. Zero pay, 400 meetings in two years. I've been in every town in the state of Arkansas. New Native, Fox 56, Pencil Bluff, Y City. You know, I mean, places nobody's even heard of. And I went on the local chapter level. I got involved leading projects, serving on committees, serving as an officer serving as a district officer, serving as a state officer, became a state chairman in charge of leadership training, went back, became chapter president, and one day, I got an unexpected phone call. Hi, Jim, this is Don Varnador at the JC's national headquarters in Tulsa. How would you like to be a full-time JC? <laughs> Thought you'd never ask. I said, doing what? He said, does it matter? I said, no. So the next day, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, interviewing for the job, which I got. And for two years, I was the, uh, what they call me, senior program manager in charge of individual development, personal growth programs for the JC's 356,000 members. Wow. I was working as an arrow to do all that JC work, but I became a magnet, and the call surprisingly came to me. Ended up two years on their national staff and then went out on my own. Earl Nightingale. I heard him on the radio in 1972. I bought his very expensive audio cassette program 
called Lead the Field, $560, and I was only making $525 on a payment plan. I bought it and uh, listened to it every day for five years. Well, in 1974, I had the opportunity to start selling his programs door to door. So I left the housing authority, started selling motivational programs door to door in Little Rock, Arkansas. And then one day, years later, I was in San Diego, California, La Jolla, and I was partners with Dr. Tony Alessandro at this time. And I was building my own business and doing very well. I was on the board of directors of the National Speakers Association. And I got a phone call. And I said, the person on the phone said, may I speak to Jim Cathcart? I said, this is he. He said, this is Earl Nightingale. Who? <laughs> Earl Nightingale. May I speak to Jim Cathcart? I said, uh, 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 which means, how may I help you, sir? And, and he said, Mr. Cathcart, I read an article of yours that would make a good audio program. We published those. I said, believe me, sir, I know. <laughs> I sent the audio program of that article he had read to Nightingale Conant in Chicago. And they said, if you'll re-record it to our standards, we will publish it. They published the album, Relationship Strategies by Dr. Tony Alessandro and me. And in 1984 and 85, they sold three and a half million dollars worth of that album worldwide. In 72, I heard him on the radio in 74, I was selling his recordings in 84, he said, ah. that felt good. That super felt good. Then I joined, at the, back in that same era, I joined the National Speakers Association. 1976, I joined while I was at the JC's headquarters. And the NSA had 200 members at the time. They hadn't grown into what they are today. So I got involved. I went to my first meeting in 1978 in Louisville, Kentucky. And I was scraping together dollars to get there. So I can identify with some of you who are here for the first time, who didn't come here out of abundance, but more out of zeal. And uh, I was there in Louisville, Kentucky, around all my heroes. And I was just, you know, I was just hoping I could stand near them and listen in. But they included me when I'd walk up. They didn't, you know, ignore me. They opened their circle and invited me in. And they said, hey, who are you? Tell us about yourself. Luckily, I didn't. I gave them a very short answer and then asked them questions. Ah, smart move. They accepted me even more because of my humility. And I started volunteering to move chairs and tables and to arrange rooms and hand out flyers and do anything I could. And then they let me do a little five-minute showcase speech. And my topic was, Become the person who would achieve your goals, and you get the goals anyway. This was 1978. Years later, I ended up inducted into the Speaker Hall of Fame, and then one day I got an unexpected phone call, and they said, Jim, we'd like you to be the keynote speaker for the National Speakers Association. You've already been our national president, but you've never headlined. And so I did a, the, the presentation that year in Dallas, and at the end of it, received the Cavett Award, which was one of the great moments of my entire career. Toastmasters. That's Joanna McWilliams. What a wonderful, beautiful person. In 1995, I received an unexpected phone call from my friend Terrence McCann the executive director of Toastmasters International. He said, Jim, we'd like you to deliver in 1995 in San Diego, California, the opening keynote speech. Wow, one of the great moments of my career, truly. And then in 2001, he called, and I remember this as vividly as any day of my life. He said, Jim, Terry McCann. I said, Terry, how's it going? He said, I got some news for you. What's that? You have been selected as the millennium recipient for 2001 of the Golden Gavel. I said, excuse me a minute. 
yes, <laughs> I'm back. Uh, <laughs> and I went to Anaheim and we had one of the most magical moments ever. There was one moment where my son and his family were sitting in the front row. And at that time, he and his wife, Sonia, only had one child, my six-month-old grandson, Jason. And I said, would you like to meet my grandson? And they said, yes. And he did the Lion King with Jason <laughs> like that. It was absolutely fabulous, and I've got it on video. Well, today, Jason's a senior at the University of California in Santa Barbara, and I would love to have a surprise pop up with him today, but we can't do that one for this meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what a wonderful, wonderful experience it's been. So you're saying, Jim, but you're not a club member. No, I have to admit I'm not a club member, but I am a toast master. <laughs> I have visual proof. And I'm a toast master in here too. I love what you do and what your organization represents in the world. So I got an unexpected phone call. Can you see a pattern here? <laughs> in 2014, Roger Dawson called me. He's a fellow speaker and a former Toastmaster. And Roger said, Jim, I've got an agent in China, Dr. David Chu, who wants to meet you. Let's meet at the National Speakers Convention in San Diego. That was 2014. So I met Dr. Chu, and he said, I want to bring you to China. He said, I represent, a, I own a company called World Masters Speakers Bureau. We've got Brian Tracy and Jay Abraham and Mark Victor Hansen of Chicken Soup for the Soul and uh, Tom Hopkins and Bob Proctor, and I want to add you because I only manage a handful of people, and they're the world's best. I said, well, wow, I'm honored. He said, I'm going to present you as the world's number one speaker trainer. I said, nah, nah, I'm not, nah, nah. He said, are you past president of NSA? Yeah. Have you received the Golden Gavel Award? Yeah. Have, have you written more than 20 books? Uh-huh. Have you been inducted into the professional speakers? Yeah. He says, Jim, if anyone can make the case you're not worthy, then let them make the case, but I'm going to promote you that way. I said, okay, knock yourself out. That ended up 23 major cities speaking to thousands and thousands of people at a time through an interpreter for up to six hours a day, 19 separate tours of China. My career, which had kind of plateaued at that point, all of a sudden took off like a rocket. I was treated like a rock star. I mean, they're chanting and cheering and everything when I came into the room, and the way I was the way I was behaving was not what they had expected. Because what they were used to is, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our featured keynote speaker. And the speaker with the entourage comes in, -da 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 -da, you know, and just acts like a guru. Well, I had fun with them. Because they had like 18 people protecting me from the audience that all wanted selfies and pieces of clothing, <laughs> things like, I mean, it was really bizarre. Uh, and uh, so my entourage would be walking along like this, you know, okay, come on, come, come. And I would, I would go for a while, and then I would take off running, and, I'd just run down. <laughs> and they, they'd all join hands, and they'd go, oh, no, oh, no, we have to catch, we have to catch. <laughs> And so I just had so much fun with them that they really embraced me, and it looked like I had a great future going, and then COVID arrived. Thank you. <sighs> Everything stopped when 2020 rolled around. So I retooled, and I started producing video courses and doing personal mentoring. And I've loved doing that. And then in 2021, pardon me, Paula, can I have a sip of water? <clears throat> Thank you. You'd expect this in Phoenix, not in Nashville. <laughs> Thank you for that. My wife, Paula. Oh, much better. 2021, I get a phone call from a former 
Gold and Gavel recipient, Dr. Nito Kubang, president of High Point University in North Carolina. Jim, it's Nito. Hey, Nito. Am I correct in remembering you don't have a college degree? Yep. I'm a college professor at Cal Lutheran University. I've written a couple of college textbooks, and I teach an executive MBA class. Don't have a degree. He said, well, High Point would like to correct that. And he invited me to High Point, North Carolina. And after my big, exciting tour of China and Taiwan, all those things that we were doing, I had the opportunity to receive, in September of last year, a business degree from High Point University. God bless him. Thank you. So this is the journey. This is, these are the stories. We're all storytellers. These are the stories I've been telling. What are the lessons? Or better yet, what is the lesson? What did you get from all of that? Because I didn't tell the stories just to talk about me. I told the stories to prove my premise. In every case, like the JCs, I was going after what I wanted like an arrow, working hard, taking on all the assignments, volunteering for roles, running for offices, and so forth. But the big breakthrough came out of the blue. They called me and said, come to national headquarters. Wow. Years later, they, like 20 years later, they called me to keynote their national convention. Wow. Earl Nightingale, I heard him on the radio. I was a clerk. I was a, a likable loser, you know, a guy with nothing going on. And all of a sudden, my whole world reorganized when I got the idea from him that even I could transform myself. I joined the National Speakers Association when it was just a little club of 200 people. It grew to become a professional organization that spawned other organizations around the world and I received their highest awards and honors. Toastmasters International honored me beyond belief, and not because I had been a, a member of a club or served in offices or served Toastmasters. Somehow, Terry McCann felt that I had the qualities that he wanted on their stage at the time. So I was working to become the person, but that was the arrow work, the magnet work, came from, as each quality was acquired, then the opportunities would arrive. In China, that came completely out of the blue. See, the purpose of what we do is not to deliver data. It's not to inform people, although that happens. The purpose of what we do as speakers is to, in some way, make life better. And the more we keep that in mind and in heart, the more we make the world a much, much better place. So I was in China, Changsha. I was delivering a speech, and I had my little entourage of security people, and my translator, Kitty, who was always by my side. And during lunch that day, after a three-hour morning seminar, I was up in the suite, just finished my meal, and Kitty said, Jim, Jim, see the security guard over there? I said, you mean the rock? This guy's like this. You know, I mean, he would not move. Solid stone, and nobody was getting past him. I said, she said, yeah, the rock. And I, I said, what about him? She said, he was talking with me on, on the way up the elevator. He said he's never heard ideas like these and it moved him very deeply. Now the ideas he, he was referring to, was I was talking about how to live a meaningful and rewarding life. Well, he didn't live in a system that encouraged that. So what I had told the audience earlier that day is I said, you must honor your country, your government. You must honor your country. You must also honor your ancestry, your family, the legacy that's been handed to you. You must honor your employer, and you must honor your gift. Because you personally 
today, with no extra training or development, can make the world a better place in small and large ways. And if you don't, you deny all of us the contributions you could have made. You must honor your gift. So she told me that The Rock had never heard ideas like this in his life, and it moved him very deeply. So after we had finished lunch, I looked around, and nobody was watching, so I went over to The Rock. And I said, excuse me. Of course, he speaks Mandarin, I speak English. I said, excuse me. And he looked at me, you know, like this. And I said, thank you very much. And he... <laughs> and he started to cry. And to make sure he wasn't embarrassed, I pulled him in. And I held him, and he started to sob. And I held him until he stopped sobbing. And then I pushed him back to arm's length, and I went like this, and he went like that. And that was it, and I went on back to my duties. Well, at the end of the day, Kitty came up to me and said, Jim, what did you do to the rock? <laughs> I promised I didn't break him. I didn't, I, 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 I'm innocent. She said, no, seriously, what did you do? And I told her. She said, Jim, he would die for you. Whoa. I said, what a responsibility. She said, you mean what an honor? I said, no. I mean, yes, it's an honor, but what a duty I have. I mean, for me to have an influence on another person so profound that they would risk their existence for my welfare, what a responsibility I have to be coming from a good place, to be offering advice that I know will make their life better, not just make me cooler or richer. What a duty I have. You see, when you're natural, when you're telling the truth on stage, then you appear to the audience as a natural. They say, wow, you're so comfortable up there. I just, I love this. Well, it's because you're telling the truth. You're not trying to fake it or, or pull something off, right? So when you're natural on stage, more people trust you. When people trust you, you impact them. You leave an imprint. And when you leave an imprint, you have a huge responsibility. So I want to praise you for what you do. I want to congratulate you for what you do. I want to encourage you to continue to do it in ways that will touch other lives positively so that you have a fulfilling career and life. And like Sam Duggar the other day when he was at our house for a visit, he said, Jim, come here. I'll show you some pictures. He got his phone out. He said, look at this. And he's showing me pictures of little model rockets that he and his granddaughter are building together to go shoot off in the local park. Is that fabulous? Yep. So, as I was saying in the 1970s, <laughs> if you will become the kind of person who would achieve your goals, you get the goals as a natural byproduct. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Jim, I'd like to present you with this small token of appreciation from Toastmasters International. I'd like to read the inscription because unless you have really good vision, you won't be able to see it. It says, in appreciation of Jim Cathcart, CSP, CPAE, for presenting at the 2022 Toastmasters International Convention, Tennessee, USA, August 22. Ooh, thank, thank you for you. sharing your message <laughs> with us. This Jim will... Cathcart, everybody. This will go in a treasured spot, and I'll see it and feel them every day. We'll see you again in another 21 years. Thank you.